If you are watching this video, then I assume you are able to speak English. You may also be able to speak another Western European language, like German or French. In which case, you are intimately familiar with this thing called nominative accusative alignment. To some of you, those terms may seem familiar, especially those who study German, Ukrainian, Latin, or Greek, as they are the names for two types of cases found in those languages that mark the subject and object of a sentence respectively. However, even if you don't speak a language with a case system like English, French, or Spanish, it's still an intrinsic part of grammar you use every day. Now, if you've been around linguistics or conlangs long enough, you've probably heard the term ergativity, or ergative absolutive alignment. You also know that it stands in some sort of contrast with nominative accusative alignment, but are having trouble fully understanding what ergativity actually does. So here's a video about it. To best illustrate how ergativity works, I'm going to create a hypothetical English that makes use of ergativity. Let's call it erglish. In the most basic form of erglish, transitive sentences will look the same as that of English. I see the man, and the man sees me. The man sees would also be the same between English and erglish. However, I see in erglish would be me see. Do you see what's going on here? In the nominative accusative English sentence, the subject pronoun of the intransitive verb, also known as the sole, as it's the sole argument of the verb, takes the same form as the subject pronoun of a transitive sentence, or agent, as it's the one doing the action. Both use the nominative case. The object of the transitive sentence, or patient, as it's the one receiving the action, is marked differently, using the accusative case. In the Orglish sentence, the subject pronoun of the intransitive sentence, the soul, takes the same form as the object pronoun of a transitive sentence, the patient, this being the absolutive case. Which means the subject of the transitive sentence, the agent, has to take a different form, which is the ergative. Now in English, we only have case on the pronoun, so here are some German translations and Ergmen translations. Notice how, just like the pronouns in the Erglish example, the subject noun of an intransitive, the soul, takes the same form as the object of a transitive, the patient, in Ergmen. In the subject of a transitive, the agent is marked differently. This is an example of morphological ergativity, where only the morphology involved is affected. However, it's only the simplest form of ergativity there is for English speakers to understand. There's another form called syntactic ergativity which actually gives the name of this field more for syntactic alignment. To better illustrate syntactic ergativity, let's go back to English and Erglish. At first glance, nothing seems too different between English and Erglish, until you notice the verb in the transitive sentences. In English, the verb only takes an S when it follows a singular noun or a third-person singular pronoun. The same can be said for the intransitive sentence in Erglish, which appears identical to English again. But in the transitive sentence, the S appears when the man is the object of the verb. This may seem confusing as to how this is ergativity, but it might make a bit more sense if we also place the subject of the intransitive verb after the verb itself. In this way, the soul is marked the same way as the patient, and both cause agreement on the verb. Now things up to this point should still be fairly simple to comprehend. Where things get trickier is when we talk about coordination. A great example of this is I see him and smile. Here, the subject of the second verb is implied to be the same as that of the first verb. In the ergative sentence, it would be I sees him and smiles. The subject of the second verb is implied to be the object of the first. Now this might seem very confusing, and is a bit beyond the scope of this basic simple video. So if you want to further explore this concept of coordination and ergative languages, I recommend checking out the link I post below. Now I've only shown morphological and syntactical ergativity separately, but it is possible to have both morphological and syntactic ergativity. This is how Erglish and Ergman would look if so. However, this type of ergativity is exceedingly rare. 
only known example being Basque, and even that is highly contested among linguists. Most languages have something known as split ergativity, where ergativity will only appear under certain circumstances. Many languages make a split between pronouns and regular nouns, where pronouns may be accusative and nouns ergative, or vice versa. The split could also be a long tense. Take Hindi, for example. It could also be lexically motivated, where only certain words can be ergative, like in English. Yes, you did hear me right, I said English, not erglish. English possesses a bunch of verbs that are ambitransitive, meaning they can either be transitive or intransitive. Take to eat as an example, you can say the man eats a cake or the man eats, and both are acceptable sentences within the language. Both also take the same subject. However, some ambitransitive verbs are ergative, where the object of the transitive form of the verb is the same as the subject of the intransitive form. Think, I broke the cup, or the cup broke. Another example is cook. I'm cooking bread versus the bread is cooking. These semantically ergative verbs actually gave rise to a new grammatical formation within English, the middle voice. This is used for describing an object's quality or ability. Think, the book reads well, or the shovel digs quickly. Now I hope this video has helped you better understand ergativity, whether you're just interested in it as a feature of language or you're creating a language yourself. If there's anything you didn't understand or anything you were confused by, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll make a video answering all of those questions. Until next time, adieu.